decided whatever you had done. Uh, for example, the their the scientists who are educated like Ogwang, the one who came up with COVIDX, but there are others like a same fuma who 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 has no education in that area, but he has been doing something that has been healing people. So this this ministry is bringing together all innovators, educated and uneducated. As long as they are innovating, it is one of the 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 the, the biggest biggest uh, effort now to get them wherever they are. The the, the that vehicle, I've forgotten the name uh, that they have come up with was first developed by people who are not educated. They had these engines, and now they have brought they brought, bring them together. This one brings this one, another one has this, and the, then they combine the, they, they put in the uh, missing link, and then you have a vehicle which can carry one ton, uh, and then you can uh, generate electricity. Uh, at the same time, can um, uh, be a water pump. Those are the kind of, uh, that, that's the purpose. Now, uh, what's the problem? Is there, I hear some noise. Okay, so <clears throat> that is one. Then the uh, education uh, curriculum has been a major problem. The people who studied through the uh, ivory tower type of education, they, they, they take so long to really adjust because they feel like we paid a big price. We spent many years in school. How can you why do you want to make things easier for the current generation? It's a very unfortunate situation, but uh, we've been trying to work with the curriculum development uh, department of education to ensure that we really eliminate those things which we no longer need. And so that children can now concentrate on what new uh, uh, innovation. We'll take a special days when we can uh, uh, exhaust some of these discussions because they're very, very wide. So I'll not go very deep into that, but uh, efforts are being made so that the whole curriculum is overhauled and so that our children don't waste time in cramming things like prelis of Canada, uh, you know, the, the, there are so many, many things, Timbukutu, there's just so many things that, you know, you keep cramming things that you're not even going to need in your life. So a lot of that was a colonial kind of setting, but even when the colonialists left more than 60 years ago, we remained bound to, to their, you know, what they had decided to make us, you know, make us a, a, a team. You, you know, you are given a, exams just to check how, how well you can remember instead of how well you can think. They don't um, examine your thinking, they examine your remembrance. So it's all about remembering, remembering this, remembering this, cramming this. It's, our, most of our exams are really checking on how people can cram. Very unfortunate. You know, then uh, uh, the question of America left God. Uh, what what uh, people don't realize is that it doesn't take so many people to transform a culture. Culture is the overall thinking and mindset of a people. So when Somebody who's outside America, when they see how America's foreign policy is being enforced, they may think all America is gay. The, the problem is that uh, what happened to America is happening to many other nations in Europe. The gay homosexuals are less than 5%, even in their headquarters in San Francisco. They don't go beyond that. The, the, the percentage is very small, but they are very strategic. What they did was to target the spheres of influence. There, they have been able to capture, they have captured the educational institutions, the best, the Ivy League uh, universities. These are Harvard, Princeton University, Yale, and so on. In other words, the best breed of Americans, uh, they, 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 they know that when you get those, they're the ones who are going to shape culture. They're going to shape uh, the politics of a nation, the policies, uh, the, the Harvard, for example, the Harvard school, business school, shapes, it is, it is the cutting edge. All these people 
people like Mike Zuckerberg and others, they're coming from there. Uh, then they, they target the media. You educate the nation through media or you influence their thinking through media, through education, through politics. The policies are passed by lawyers in, in, in Congress, the, the lower house and the upper house, or the judges. So what you do, target the brains of the nation, the top brains in Harvard, in Yale, in the best universities. Uh, expel God from those institutions. Make sure these people are secular. Make sure they, you, you stop them from talking about God. You influence them in the negative direction. And when they come out with whatever inventions they have, whether science, whether arts and entertainment, whether films, whether media, news, make sure they, they remove God, they talk against God. They, so that is exactly what these people have done. And so when you look at America from a, a, a person who doesn't know America, they will see a, a, a nation which is very ungodly, it does not want God, banned God from the public schools, you no longer talk about God, Ten Commandments, what? So that is the, the real situation. Although there are so many others who are praying, sang, uh, praying, uh, uh, who love God, who there are so many. They they constitute fifty one percent now. They used to be about sixty something percent. The evangelicals used to be about sixty. Now they are down to about fifty one percent. So they still make the majority. Uh, but unfortunately, that they the unfortunate part is that the the, the ungodly have targeted the spheres of influence. This include politics, arts and entertainment, media, education. That, that, that's where they take, and of course, business. So once you get especially those five, I've left out the, the family and the church as such. But, but the other five, they have almost captured them. They have captured them totally. Media. That's why they keep talking about fake news because they only promote what they want. Look at what they, whenever something happens in Israel, it is the negative press that will dominate. They don't bring out the truth, they bring out what they want to promote. Uh, arts and entertainment, look at the film industry, look at the levels of moral decadence in that. So a, 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 somebody in Saudi Arabia or any Arab nation, every time they look at these films, they wonder how these Americans can be Christians and still. So for them, they don't know that there is freedom for people to. They think everything they see in films and what is that? Those are the Christians. For them, they think that those are the Christians because for them, a Muslim can't watch that, cannot drink, uh, be uh, what be drunk. So so that that is the whole idea. That is why. People think America is, is ungodly and left God. So I, I wanted to explain that. Now, let me go back to what we were discussing, but put it in context. We're looking at, at, at science from the perspective of the Bible. Uh, for Bishop, those who are not, did you yes? consider uh, Rodin's question? Oh, what the question was about uh, Rodin's, um, say that again. Was his question? Let him state it again. I think it disconnected. Okay, I'll end with it. Uh, you remind me of that because I came in the middle of that. But let me recap for those who are not with us to look at exactly what we're discussing. I discussed the context of science. Is this something totally? Uh, outside the Bible, or is it part of the Bible? My answer is this is part of the Bible. Uh, God created us uh, as human beings and gave us responsibility over the earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. And he said at the beginning, let us create man in our image and after our likeness, let them have dominion over all the earth. So man was given dominion over the earth. And the way he was going to do this was to cultivate the earth uh, because where God put, planted him or planted a garden is where he put man, Eden. In Eden, he placed the man there, the man who he, has, he had formed. 
he put him in Eden, which was heaven on earth. It was a colony. It was like a colony. Colony is a place where you, you, the, 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 the kingdom which rules eh, has, has, has taken over. The culture of that uh, outpost is the culture of the ruling empire. If you say uh, uh, Philippi were the colon of the, of the Romans, so you'd see that city of Philippi had all the Roman citizens were there. The uh, veterans, uh, retired civil servants. That's why the city of Philippi was a city or referred to as a Roman colony. Uh, a colony uh, is, is a place where the culture of the ruling empire is, is dominant. So God wanted Eden on earth to portray the character, the, the culture of heaven, the culture of heaven. That is what we are here for, so that we represent heaven. We are the embassy. Our embassy is, is to, to represent uh, uh, heaven as ambassadors. So that is God's idea, the purpose. There are two things. One is the purpose, another one is environment. The purpose is to exercise dominion, uh, have a right, ability, desire, and duty to exercise that dominion. He has given us the right, he has given us the ability, he has given us the desire, and he has given us the duty to exercise dominion. That is number one. But then number two, we replicate heaven on earth. That is very important. We create an environment around us. So that's why in Eden was the rivers, gold, tree of life, and God's presence. This is what we are supposed to spread over the earth. It is now was, was restricted in heaven, I said in Eden, we're not clear. It was going to spread all over. That was Adam's responsibility. Spread Eden as, as the waters cover the sea. So the work he does, he extends the culture and worship. Only culture and worship. Network is not very good. Bear with him when he's in Ginger Network is not very good. But let's trust it's coming back. I realized that I'd gotten cut off. My network here may not be at the best, but I'm, I'm, I'm back. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, I got cut off. I had not even realized that I'd been, uh, the network had gone off. Okay. So I was explaining, can you give me back uh, uh, so that I can share? Uh, let me see. Hello, hello, hello. Am I back? Hello. Yes, you are. Okay. So I was showing you one is colony. Second is I spent a, a bit of time to talk about the colony where you extend uh, the embassy of uh, one empire one kingdom to another. 
and we as ambassadors or other DCs, the communist world, we are we have a responsibility to take uh, the, the 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 colony is it has to do with the leadership, but the the the, the second world culture has to do with the the whole thinking, the mindset of the people. When you talk about colony, somebody understands subjugation. These people have been conquered. They're now under another kingdom. But when you talk about culture, it, it, talk, it says more than just being conquered. They have now been influenced. They have willingly taken on the culture of the other people. Culture includes language, dress, uh, so dance, so many things. When you look at our youth today, they, they don't want to speak their language, local language. They think by speaking English, they are more modern and cute. They think we are now better because our, you know, we, we speak the British English or the American English. Or for me, I don't know how to speak the, the you know, Luganda. They can't speak their own language. They can't even spell their family name right. They can't say it. So, so this is, a, you take on a new culture. This is what happened when the British took over here. They started to change the culture of the people to show them that your culture is inferior, ours is superior. Now, uh, let me, before I go deeper into the culture, let me recap on the part of the dominion mandate. We, the, the dominion mandate is uh, for us to take the earth is raw material, turn it into finished product. That is what transformation does, value addition. Transformation enables us to take the earth from its raw material form and transform it into finished products. Failure to do that is poverty and backwardness. Poverty is the premier indicator of failed dominion. When people have failed to do uh, their dominion, to exercise dominion over the earth, what the result is poverty. Man, on the other hand, apart from poverty, when man fell, he got morally uh, corrupted, morally decadent. So these are the two major uh, ways uh, uh, who were affected by the fall. One, the fall which brought sin, brought moral decadence within, corruption within. Number two, it resulted into our failure to relate to creation the way we should. Our relationship with God was affected morally, so we, our fellowship was cut. Our relationship was affected. But then also, our look at these two relationships. Man relates vertically to God and horizontally with the rest of the creation. When man fell, the two relationships, one of the fellowship is affected, and the one of stewardship is also affected. In one way, he becomes corrupt because the life of God no longer flows. It's like a, and now the life of God has been short circuited like a pipe, which had blockage. Life is no longer flowing, so that his fellowship affected, and so man starts to become corrupt, just like a a, a fruit is disconnected from the source. That fruit starts to rot. If that fruit is connected to, to, the, to the tree or branch, then it remains with life. But the moment life is cut, immediately corruption sets in and the decadent, moral, moral decadence took place. But then also our relationship with our creation is affected. We are no longer able to exercise dominion as we should. However, uh, 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 this, this Satan looks at that and says, this is what I want. I want the cor moral corruption, and I want man in his failed dominion, because then I can use him. I can use him in the negative way to build my kingdom instead of building God's kingdom. So Satan uses both to oppress and destroy God's image in us. So what is God's solution? We looked at that. Francis Bacon was one of the fathers of modern science and was the first one to uh, put it in a simple way for us to understand. He said that man fell in two ways. One, from his state of innocence, and two, 
from his state of dominion over creation. I've put one in blue and another in red. So the two falls, the, the two way in which man fell is in, in this life, both of those two ways can be made good. The first is by religion and faith. The second one is by science and technology. Through science and technology, we reassert our dominion. By faith and religion, we are reconnected back to God. But through science and technology, we are able to reclaim our lost dominion over creation. This is how science and technology becomes very important to us. And we looked at that yesterday, and we saw that science and technology is a combination. Whereas the, the first one involves the heart, the second one involves the head and the hands, thinking and skills. Thinking and skills is science. You have to think, you have to do a lot of observation persistently. It takes hard work to do that. So thinking with your head and working with your hands results into technology. So through our faith, we reclaim our lost image of God. But through our hard work, science and technology, we reclaim our lost dominion and dignity. Why dignity? Because if you do what horses can do, what cows can do, what wind can do, wind can push water from the bottom of the hill uphill. You can use a donkey, you can use a cow, you can ox, you can use a horse. But if you do it, then that means you as a person, you know, your dignity, you are lost, your, your, your dignity is lost. That is what technology does. It stops us from doing things that are not, uh, 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 that affect our dignity as human beings, as the image of God. And another one called Sexta, Sue Victor. Sue Victor also taught the same thing. He says, because we have defective minds, we need to study theology. Because we have defective morals, we need to study ethics. Because we have defective bodies, we need technology to supplement our physical weaknesses, which came as a result of fall. This, this shaped the thinking of the, uh, the Western world. Those are the four H's that the first three, then you added a fourth where you handle the relationship of loving your neighbor as yourself, uh, having compassion and care for the people around you. So when you combine those, you'll find the head, the heart, the hands, and the house. I've put those in a purple so that you can see the difference. Our education, therefore, should be should handle those four. Head, which is academic, heart, which is the morals, hands, which the skills, and house, my love for my labor, my compassion and care for the people around me, my uh, community responsibility, that is house. So the, those four are very, very important. So to transform any society, you must address all those four. If they are not addressed, for example, if you all you do is to teach the head, all you all have is academic. People will not have the heart, that is the morals, they will not have skills, they may not even love the neighbor. And we have so many people like that. They steal and they don't feel anything. Whether people around them are dying, they don't mind. So this, this is what we are uh, dealing with now. Uh, the emphasis at, at particular this particular week is on science and technology, meaning the head and the hands. Uh, but we also saw that God has written three books, and education exists to help students to study, to study those three books and dispense his truth. God's truth comes through those three books. I repeat that. The purpose of those three books is to dispense truth. That truth in those three books has to be extended to everybody, to the masses. 
So it is this mountain of education that is supposed to help enable everybody to study those three books. What are those three books? The first is the book of God's word. The second is the book of his works. The third is the book of God's reason within us. We all know the book of God's word. That's what we do as pastors. We teach people the book of his words. But the second book is what most people or many people don't understand and what I'm doing, dealing with this time. Science is the study of nature. When you study nature, you are studying the second book. You are studying the truth, not this time from the Bible, but from science. So when you discover that the atom is no longer the smallest. Uh, so the, everything we discover is the truth. How human beings, I mean, the anatomy of man, biology, uh, botany, zoology. See, all this is the truth. It is the truth of God's word. That is science. Then we start the history because God has revealed himself through, for example, the history of Israel. We see God more about his truth in the, in the lives, the way he has dealt with the people. We, we learn. Then in culture, people's culture, very important. So when you combine the uh, science is history. So when we come at the end, we'll, when he was uh, uh, actually unveiling his nature through uh, uh, the, the ages, uh, different ages when he revealed himself to men. But then the culture. Some people have a negative attitude about culture. I want to say something about that. But before I go to that, let me finish this one here. Uh, Psalms 1, 1, 1, verse 2. Uh, mentions the fact that uh, 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 it, it, is, it is written, the majestic are the works of the Lord. Those who delight in them, study them. Majestic are the works of the Lord. Those who delight in them, study them. Now, the scientists follow here. They look at God's works. That is its nature. That is history. That is culture. They delight in God's works and they study them. So scientists are doing a good job because they are studying the second book. Those who do science or scientists are studying the truth. They are, they are observing the truth. They are studying the truth. They study history. They study, you know, uh, uh, the interpretations may vary. But studying and understanding is part and parcel of appreciating the God whom we serve. And this is very, very important. Humanities, humanities is a study of how God has evolved and worked through the different cultures at different times. Those humanities, in a, you know, as the opposite of divinity. Divinity, you are studying God and humanity, you are studying the history of man and so on. So these are God's works. And the single most important fact behind, factor behind the scientific revolution was when the inductive, literal, and objective method, the reformation used in studying the Bible was applied to study nature. This is what resulted into science, modern science. The, before the prostrate start revolution, there was not much advancement. But when they started to apply the same principles, those three principles, inductive, literal, and objective method of studying the first book was applied on the second book, then science boomed. So you can see what this means. It means that we are not yet supposed to study the Bible which is the book of God's words, we are also supposed to study the book of his works. Jesus told the Pharisees, you do error, not knowing the scriptures, that is the first book, nor the power of God, the works of God, that is the second book. He said, the reason you people error, you Pharisees, is because you don't know both of these books. 
and they were hypocrites. Therefore, they were also lacking in the third book, the, the conscience. So you, we can see that very readily in how he was reprimanding them. So the scientific revolution, I'm repeating, started when the Protestant hermeneutic reading of the Bible literally was applied to the study of the second book. That's why the world's first scientific laboratory in Cavendish in Cambridge has that inscription. It is still there. Majestic are the works of the Lord. Those who delight in them studied them. It is this desire to study the works of God that produced modern science. Modern science was produced by a people who desired to study the works of God. Now, let's look at culture. Culture, as I said earlier, people have a kind of a negative view about culture. But God has created us in such a way that he, he has picked us from different, you know, he's given us, what, what is culture in the first place? What is culture? Our culture are a gift from God. God is a God of variety. He enjoys our diversity. Culture is the manifestation of the collective thinking and behavior of a people. It includes our language. It includes our music. It includes our dance, our dress, our names, social norms, traditions like weddings, like Kokwanjula. All this is our culture. All this should be developed in line with the word of God. God wants our culture, but it has to remain in line with God's word. So not only did he reprimand the Pharisees for not knowing the scriptures, but he was saying you've promoted a negative culture. Where the traditions you are holding on to are contrary to my word. So the culture you should maintain, you have, should have, but you should not divorce it from God's word. The first book should be connected to the second book and should be connected to the third book. For you, you are being hypocrites. That is, the third book is not being followed. And then you do not know the scriptures. That is the first book. Know the power of God. That is the second book. So you can see Jesus is reprimanding the Pharisees for not uh, understanding or reading or studying the three books. So God wants us to promote our culture without contravening God's word. The, the first book and the second book must be in agreement. The more you study the first one, the better you do the second one. When Newton, Isaac, Isaac Newton was asked how he could quickly come up with these, or they thought it was easy. He says, how did, easily did you come up with these powerful, powerful inventions about Newton's law of motion? How did you come? He said, because I studied the first book very much. So it enables me to understand the second book. The first book is the Bible. He wrote a whole commentary on the book of Revelation and on the book of Daniel. Now, anybody who can write a commentary on a book, even if it was one, must be somebody who is really, really committed. So he wrote more about the Bible than even science. So when people were wondering, he told them the secret that I spend a lot of time in the first book. That's why I'm able to discover all this, which is the second book in science. So let me go back to culture. Uh, in the book of Revelation, John saw that when we, at the end of the age, people will come from all tribes and languages and they will stand before God singing and worshiping God. So God enjoys uh, uh, variety. Our cultures, as long as they remain in line, with his word, we should redeem and promote them from witchcraft. Witchcraft at attacked our cultures when man fell. Witchcraft is the culture of fallen humanity. It started with Nimrod just before the Tower of Babel. Nimrod was a hunter who got in touch with foreign angels, made pictures of these animals uh, which he was hunting, made them gods and idols, and people started to worship them. That's how people's culture started to get perverted. And so majority of foreign humanity now, it went into idolatry. Witchcraft has a negative effect on society. It hinders progress and it also hinders science and advancement. It will end the, sort of the first book and also the second book 
and also the third book. So witchcraft counter is counter to those three books. When you are getting in, when you get involved in witchcraft, what happens? You 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 lose connection with those three books. Witchcraft believes that the world is inhabited by spirits. This is one of the worst uh, diversionary ways of worship. You remember we looked at colony as the first word. The second was culture. The third was worship. The whole purpose of witchcraft is to take us away from the worship of God. So witchcraft believes that the world is inhabited by spirits. It connects us to spirits instead of God. So it teaches that to do anything, you need the permission of these spirits. And you have to sacrifice and appease these spirits before you can do anything with creation. The Judeo-Christianity teaches that nature is not divine. Witchcraft teaches that nature is right now. It takes you from the creator to the create to the creature. So the attention, witchcraft takes you from the creator and focuses on the created, on the creature. That's the problem with witchcraft. So Judeo-Christian takes us back to say nature is not divine. It is under God, but not inhabited by God. It does not have a purpose of its own, but only that which God and man assigns to us. So nature should not be worshipped. Nature is not divine. Nature is not God. It should never be worshipped. It only has that assignment that God does assign to it or man, because man was given dominion over nature. So we should not worship nature. If you worship nature, you cannot exercise dominion over it. You cannot harness nature when you are worshiping it. If you worship Budagari, the followers, and you said, no, no, you don't touch that because the spirits are annoyed. You see, you, many of you heard what was going on when Budagari, the government had to pay them a lot of money to go and worship elsewhere. They had refused. So the fall, the waters cannot be built into a dam to generate electricity just because the spirits have, have refused. So they had to give them money to appease the spirits. You can imagine, eh? that is what it is. You can't uh, build a dam here without the permission of Udagari. You have to pay Udagari uh, before he can allow you to build a dam. That is, that is, that is uh, uh, witchcraft. Now, nature glorifies God. The falls, the waterfalls as we see them, all these when you look at them, beauty and what God, you see how God is a God of beauty. Uh, all the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, as Psalms 19 says. But God is not resident in nature. So we should not worship nature because God is not resident there in that fall, in that rock, in that big tree. God is not resident there. He transcends nature. So the relationship between God and nature is that of a painter and his painting. Not that of a dance and a, dance, a dancer and his dance. There is a difference there. They are both works of art. The painting is a work of art, and the dance is also a work of art. But there is a difference. When a painter paints a painting and puts it there, you look at it, you like it, you, 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 you really enjoy it. But the painter is seated somewhere else. It's different with the dance and the dancer. You can't separate them. When I call you, come forward and dance, I can't say, oh, you go back, let the dance remain here. The dance and the dancer cannot be separated, but the painter and the painting can be separated. So the relationship between God and the nature is that of a painter and his painting, not that of a dancer and the dance. The painting reflects some of the painter's glory, but the painter is not in the painting. So the same way, our relationship with nature should be as that of a painting and a painter. Man who was created in God's image also transcends nature. So just like God, we also transcend nature. We are above it. We're not supposed to worship it. The battle between God and Satan on earth is that battle of culture. Whoever controls the mind of society will create the culture. As a man thinks in his heart, the Bible says, so is he. The heart is the mindset. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of the heart manifested in the culture of the people. So this is very important. That's why you go back to these three books. 
Christian scholars agree about those three books. The book of his words, the book of his works, the book of his reason in us. That's why you have to go back and put them in the right order. Honor God and his word, and then the works, and then our conscience. All have to be read and studied. And this worldview is what inspired the universities like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and all the others. Now, uh, we, we covered that God wants uh, people to know him, all the people, everybody. So when he took the Hebrews from Egypt, he gave them a script, a written script, and he required that everybody should read and study. Every man should teach his home. So imagine giving a written text to slaves who don't even go to school. God wanted to turn Israel into a great nation. So he required everyone to read, to learn, to write, to think. Every man had to teach his family the law. So when you sit down, when you are in the field, everywhere you are, eh, that is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Deuteronomy. Not uh, he says, do this. This is promoting grassroots intellectualism. He wanted everybody. That's how you change the culture of the people. Okay? Grassroots intellectualism, you, everybody is able to think. And he, that, that is what turned the Hebrew dialect. It was originally a simple dialect, and it was turned into a literal language. What is the difference between a dialect and a literal language? A dialect is just a language which has people speak, but it has no written orthography. Turning oral dialects into literal languages promotes literacy, education, mass communication. It makes printing and publishing commercially viable mass media, and therefore you can spread it. That's how media comes in. Mass media is very, very important. In the Reformation, uh, printing and publishing became commercially viable. And so the fires of reformation spread all over Europe. That is how it becomes the, the, the culture. You change culture by mass media. This is what the devil is doing with our culture, turning people into being very moral because of spreading sexual immorality, spreading these gender things, LGBT and so on, is to, to impact culture. And the, 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 the way he does it is through language. Language is a very, very important part of culture. And so the devil uses it. Social media now is a big issue. Making the language of the common man, the language of learning, the language of art, the language of literature, science, commerce, law, and government, democratizes knowledge and it leads to mass civic education. Mass civic needs to understand so that they make a choice of the kind of government they want. You cannot have a government of the people, by the people, for the people, unless it functions in the language of the people. It has to be in the language of the people understand so that they make uh, choices uh, that they, they, they understand. So this was the vision and the achievement. Let Julius Nyerere of Tanzania understood this very much. He said, you must have people of, have the same language. He promoted Swahili so that the people, when people have the same language, the ideas and concepts spread very, very, very fast. That's how Nimrod spread witchcraft so fast because they had the same language the, the, at that time. For example, when the language of the common man becomes the language of science, you promote technology because scientific ideas and concepts are easily grasped. Uh, applied and developed. South Korea, China, other uh, Asian nations have advanced very fast in technology because science is being taught in their languages. Here we have to go through English. There, the car is Hyundai. You know, in China, they have those, those big names. They are, they are studying in their language. Scientific ideas and concepts are easily grasped applied and developed. So these people are combining the culture, which includes language and science. The Chinese and Indians are producing 
half a million scientists every year, while the US is producing 60,000. Those are the two leading nations now, currently. In as far as commerce and the GDP is concerned, they are the foremost. But the key there is that they have adopted uh, science and technology, and they have, they have understood the impact of language. That is where we are going. In their bid to eradicate witchcraft and turn people to God, the missionaries ended up destroying our good part of our culture, inadvertently branding all our cultures evil. It was unfortunate because they made everything we did here evil. For example, when our languages were discouraged, it discouraged our technological advancement. Local artisans have always been vacated, so we became a market for European products. Our uh, uh, textile industry, Embugo, stagnated. Uh, say Embugo is a stand. The drums stop stop making those drums. Who bring you keyboards and the and the pianos and organs? So this 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 what happened. Uh, the, the this this was an unfortunate development. But not all our local names, for example, were necessarily demonic. Uh, but then uh, uh, they, they, they said, no, 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 stop these names. And then, so th this is a, a, a something that we need to rethink because God enjoys our cultures. Names are very important because they are prophetic. You, you are declaring the child is, you are declaring the child is a, 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 a future when you name them. For, for us, there are bad names that we should not have really retained, like Zajandaba, Zueta, Zabandola, Zansanze, Zuamba, Zakula, Zikulabe, Biekwaso, Magombe, Sewanaku, Wandra De, Nyamayaro, Ugo Jami, and Difakuria. These are not good. Names which are not bad, the names which are we should, but they will be to are prophesying negative bad names, removing the bad names and replacing them with good names. That is the biblical. God changed Jacob's name. Jacob means a supplanter and made him Israel, the prince with God. Renamed Simon. Simon means a reed, somebody unstable. And dependable. Renamed him Peter, which means the rock. So we can see how that is important and the difference that a, a culture makes today. I've introduced this part and I want you to think about it uh, because of its importance. I've gone a little bit beyond the time, but I wanted you to see the same way we've misunderstood science. We have also, in a way, misunderstood culture, uh, failing to differentiate between what is godly and what is not. In both cases, we have missed the mark. One way to keep slaves backward in America was to limit their education, to promote, refusing to promote their language and their culture. That was the same strategy in apartheid South Africa. The promotion of cultural education, which includes language, promotes grassroots intellectualism, ethnic languages, linkages, national cohesion, Tanzania, look at the stability of Tanzania. It all comes from the issue of language. In Tanzania, everybody speaks uh, uh, Swahili. All people are taught to study Swahili and it connects the people so easily. None of our East African countries have been able to achieve that. Of all the achievements that Nyerere achieved, that was a big one. Our young people today are hanging without culture. They think being westernized is cute and modern. They cannot speak their mother tongue. They cannot greet in their language. They can't pronounce their father's name or mother's name or family name. You know, I remember in one retreat we had the, some of children stand up and they spoke, you know, their family name and we could not even understand it. The mother stood up and said, let me redeem our family name because these, <laughs> these children here have murdered our, <laughs> because, they, you know, deliberately refuse to, to speak it in the right way, westernizing the pronunciations and that kind of thing. Let me end with this quotation. 
by uh, Lord Macrae when he was addressing the British Parliament on the 2nd of February, 1835. Some people say it is fake, others say it's not it's true, but you never know. But in case it's true, what, what did he say? What did he say? He said, I've traveled across the length and breadth of Africa and I have not seen one person who is a beggar, who is a thief, such wealth I have seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber, that I do not think we would ever conquer this country unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. And therefore, I propose that we replace, replace her old and ancient education system, her culture. For if the Africans think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want them, uh, a truly dominated people. With that, I hand over back to you, Bishop Kabuye. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much.